We've all chugged our fair share of soda, coffee, and tea, but how much do you really know about them? Turns out, most of our favorite drinks have stranger backstories than an evil twin on a daytime soap opera. So today, we're pouring out some thirst-quenching facts about popular beverages. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. And after that, please leave a comment and let us know what other beverages you would like to hear about. Okay, who's buying this round? Bully, bully. No. Drinks around the house. If you've ever wondered why root beer is called root beer, you're not alone. First of all, there's no beer in it, which should be illegal. That name is beverage fraud. So where did it come from? Well, root beer, in its many formulations, was a traditional American concoction that was originally considered a medicinal drink. Depending on where you got it from, it usually included some mix of roots, leaves, and flowers from various plants like sarsaparilla, sassafras, wintergreen, or ginger. And through the first half of the 19th century, it was consumed hot. Because we didn't know things back then. The carbonated vending machine version we all know today is reportedly the creation of Pennsylvania resident Charles E. Hires, a pharmacist who first tasted the drink on his honeymoon. And that's what he remembered about the trip? Dang, Chuck. Hires came up with his own recipe for an extract, which he initially offered as a do-it-yourself home kit for people to brew using water, sugar, and yeast. Boy, imagine doing all of that work for hot root beer. By 1893, Hires had also become the first person to bottle the stuff and sell it to enthusiastic customers, although it was still marketed as a medicine. By at least one account, Hires had been asked to develop a beverage to combat hard drinking during the temperance movement leading up to Prohibition. While he supposedly preferred the name Root Tea, his friend Russell Conwell, who eventually founded Temple University, persuaded him to change it to root beer in 1875 or 1876. Evidently, Conwell was an ordained minister of marketing. Whatever the case, root beer was reportedly very popular during Prohibition, with brands like A&W available as early as 1919. Have you ever looked at the side of an orange juice container and wondered, where is concentrate? And why do they have all the oranges? When an OJ carton says from concentrate, it means it has been dehydrated or compressed and then recombined with water to make the product you now see before you. Not from concentrate means all that stuff didn't happen. He asked me if I'd squeeze him some more orange juice. There's no real difference when it comes to the nutritional value of orange juice that is or isn't from concentrate, but concentrated OJ travels more safely and efficiently. In fact, the reason orange juice from concentrate was invented was so the U.S. military could provide troops with sufficient amounts of vitamin C during World War II. There weren't any Whole Foods in Normandy at the time, so the fighting men didn't have access to fresh fruit. So the federal government, the National Research Corporation, and the Florida Department of Citrus joined forces to create frozen orange juice concentrate. You know, that stuff everyone is buying and selling at the end of trading places. The government made a noble effort, but by the time the product was ready to go, the war was thankfully over. In 1946, the result of all that effort was deployed to supermarkets instead, under the name Minute Maid. The first thing Kool-Aid Man would tell you if he suddenly burst through your living room wall, other than, oh yeah, of course, would be, my name used to be Fruit Smack Man. Oh no! Back in the 1910s, Iowa native Edwin Perkins created a remedy to quit smoking called Nixotine, which is, which is not bad, Edwin. More importantly, its success provided him with the financial capital to develop and market more than a hundred other products for household and medicinal use. Among his bestsellers was a concentrated drink called Fruit Smack, but because it was liquid, shipping it or selling it door to door presented certain challenges. One day, Perkins was reminded of when he was a child working in his father's general store and first saw Jell-O dessert mix. The ease with which the powdered Jell-O was packaged and transported gave Perkins the idea to develop a comparable powdered fruit drink. He introduced Kool-Aid, spelled A-D-E, in 1927, offering it in six flavors, grape, lemon lime, cherry, orange, raspberry, and strawberry. He also later changed the spelling of the second half of the name to AID, presumably because he got tired of people asking where the Cool Odd was. By 1929, Kool Aid was available nationwide, and in 1934, was introduced to the international market. It proved to be so successful, Perkins and his wife Kitty moved from Nebraska to Chicago, where he opened a factory. By 1950, Kool Aid was making more than 10 million in sales annually, which is good because their spokesman must cost them a fortune in home repair. 
According to a study from 2017, 7% of American adults believe chocolate milk comes from brown cows. That is an alarming number of people, pointing out the obvious, but that's not how it works. Irish botanist Sir Hans Sloane has historically been credited with inventing chocolate milk in the late 15th century. Reportedly, Sloane visited Jamaica and tried to drink cacao with water but didn't like it. As an alternative, he mixed it with milk and sugar and went head over heels for the stuff. Of course, mixing cacao with milk and sugar was almost certainly something the indigenous people already did, but it was Sloane who took the mixture to Europe. During the subsequent years, chocolatiers would claim he'd discovered that milk and cocoa beans make perfect partners. And as a result, he is often incorrectly credited with inventing the drink entirely. Gatorade was developed at the University of Florida in 1965 by Dr. James Robert Cade, which makes you wonder why it isn't called Caterade. Anyway, as the first sports drink ever, it was supposed to help replenish athletes who lost fluids and electrolytes through sweat and other excretions. Sorry, we'll try to avoid using the word excretions in the future. According to Stephanie Bales of the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention, at the time Gatorade was developed, people weren't even encouraged to drink water while exercising because the belief was it would cause your body to cramp up. Cade, a nephrologist, set out to address the situation and created a mixture of water, sodium, and sugar, but not so much sugar that it would upset their stomachs. A test group of football players sampled his first version of Gatorade, but they found it unpalatable. That's a nice way of saying that one of the researchers immediately threw up after drinking it and said, it sort of tasted like toilet bowl cleaner. So to make the beverage easier to drink, Cade's wife Mary, the real hero of the story, told him to add lemon juice. And it worked. When members of the University of Florida football team drank Gatorade during a game against Louisiana State soon after, the Gators won in a come-from-behind upset. And more importantly, no one threw up. Coca-Cola was produced as early as 1929 in Germany, and through the early 1930s, it was as popular as, well, Coca-Cola. Part of the American company's strategy to introduce the drink to the world included being present at sporting events like the 1936 Olympics, the one famously hosted by Hitler. It, uh, wasn't a good look for Coke or the Olympics that year. Coca-Cola GmbH, the German subsidiary, was focused on becoming a drink for all Germans. But when World War II broke out, a lack of materials like sugar made it impossible for Coca-Cola GmbH to keep up production. So the company shifted to using local goods and, in the end, came up with a completely different soft drink, Fanta. Short for the German word for fantasy, the soda included leftovers from leftovers at first, but beet sugar was eventually used in the recipe. This made it sweet, so consumers actually wanted to drink it. The original version of Fanta was discontinued after the war. But when Fanta was reintroduced in 1955, it was the version we now know as Fanta Orange. When Crystal Pepsi launched in 1992, it was advertised as containing 100% natural flavors with no preservatives, no caffeine, a low amount of sodium, and a ton of Van Hager. Although, as anyone who ever tasted one can tell you, it was about as close to a diet soda as a bottle of log cabin syrup. Crystal Pepsi tastes to me like a more subtle cola. I think that's the best way to say it. It doesn't taste like uh, any other clear drinks that I've tasted. It's got a different taste. Crystal Pepsi was hyped to the moon leading up to its release, so Coca-Cola had to respond. But after that new Coke thing, they were unwilling to take risks with their flagship soda. So they released Tab Clear instead. But here's the catch. Coca-Cola had no intention of making Tab Clear a success. The beverage was released specifically to torpedo Crystal Pepsi. Coca-Cola marketer Sergio Zyman later admitted that Coca-Cola had a specific plan, saying in 2011, it was a suicidal mission from day one. The Coke folks knew that Pepsi people had spent an enormous amount of money on the brand, so they decided to purposefully sabotage it. And it worked. The writing on the wall was crystal clear for both brands within six months. In movies and TV, when a reluctant hero has been hitting the bottle and needs to sober up for the big fight, someone always suggests a cup of coffee. In reality, coffee has no sobering effects whatsoever. John McClane was getting by on pure vibes in that third movie. Scientifically speaking, there's nothing in coffee that decreases the presence of alcohol in someone's system, and it doesn't help you process alcohol more quickly. 
Coffee and its BFF ingredient caffeine can make a person more alert, but that's not always a good thing if you're intoxicated. As researcher Thomas Gould from Temple University put it, the co-use of caffeine and alcohol could actually lead to poor decisions with disastrous outcomes. Another. So, uh, take it easy on the Irish coffees. Your average tea bag generally contains from 1 to 4 grams of loose tea leaves, although it varies depending on the type of tea and what else might be included, and whether or not the Lipton guy was on the packaging. And because camellia leaves are part of the lives of a number of insects before being picked, dried, and packaged, those leaves contain much more than flavor. In 2022, researchers determined that tea contains DNA from hundreds of insects. <laughs> now, they said it was only a tiny fraction, but enough to help scientists better understand the movements and activities of insects over time. Researchers chose tea and herbs for the study, specifically because they are not as processed as products like coffee. That means more bugs! That Lipton guy is starting to look better and better. In 1985, Coca-Cola decided to change its beloved recipe, beginning one of the most spectacularly awful marketing disasters in history. It's like a ghost story executives tell each other. New Coke was met with protests. It was poured into sewers, and thousands of phone calls and letters flooded into the company with comments like, I don't think I'd be more upset if you were to burn the flag in our front yard. Jeez, hate to see that guy take the Pepsi challenge. Roberto Goizueta, the company's CEO at the time, claimed New Coke was smoother, rounder, yet bolder, a more harmonious flavor. What this meant was that it tasted more like Pepsi. The campaign to promote New Coke cost Coca-Cola millions in marketing and product development, and people hated it so much it only lasted 79 days on the market. While Americans were outraged by the switch, it was, perhaps, commentary by an international observer that left the biggest mark. Goizueta started working for the company in Havana, Cuba in 1954, but moved to the U.S. when Fidel Castro took control of the government. Castro, while staunchly anti-American, continued to drink Coca-Cola even after the company left Cuba. When New Coke launched, Castro reportedly weighed in and called it symptomatic of American decay. People take Coke very seriously. In the end, according to Goizueta, New Coke actually made the company stronger, as consumers welcomed the return of Coca-Cola Classic to store shelves, eventually reinvigorating the brand. You really can't beat the real thing. So what do you think? Which of these stories surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.